Inscription is also going to get started, which is really cool. And if you have any questions, uh, be sure to post all of those in the chat. Uh, we will mute all of the mics um, until it's time for questions. So that way uh, everybody is able to hear us and there isn't any ambient noise going on. All right, so welcome to the request for proposals review. Um, this is for round 20 and round 21 of our affordable materials grants. If you had applied a long while ago, you may have seen these as textbook transformation grants. Uh, we've changed that in order to reflect the two different kinds of grants that we have and the fact that we're using uh, more than just textbooks. So, uh, okay, I am going to quickly change the meeting options here. There we go. Um, I'll enable the microphone for attendees uh, as soon as there's a question section and stuff like that. But if you have any questions that come up while the uh, presentation is going, just type them in the chat and we'll be able to see them. OK, so first off, we're going to do some introductions. Um, we know from past experience, especially in our kickoff meetings, that if we do this over the mic, this will take us an hour and then we'll be done. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're not doing just that. Um, so in chat, please share uh, where you're coming from, your institution or your department. Um, is this your first time uh, doing any kind of ALG project or are you returning? And why is open important to you? Why are affordable resources important to you? Uh, so if you can enter those in the chat box, uh, everybody can read those and see um, who you are and where you're coming from. Uh, while you're doing that, I can just fill you in on uh, me for a second here. Uh, I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the program director of Affordable Learning Georgia. Uh, I've been basically running the program since 2014 as a visiting program officer in uh, at Valdosta State University. I came to the system office in 2016 and I'm a librarian. I've been doing that ever since. Um, affordable and open has always been something that's uh, important to me. Even as a musician, I was imagining my dissertation would be a set of uh, recitals of Creative Commons uh, license uh, commissioned works, but I decided to become a librarian, so that didn't happen. Uh, Tiffany, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm. I, my name is Tiffany Tijerina. Um, I am the program manager for Affordable Learning Georgia. Um, previously, I was an instructional designer at Kennesaw State University, um, and so that is most of my background is instructional design and technical writing work. Um, so not a librarian. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I did before I before I started working with ALG, um, I used to do a lot of these grants myself. I used to work with a lot of faculty at KSU to make these make their grant projects work and and uh, I did a lot of pro uh, project management for them. Um, affordable and open resources are important to me because I paid a lot of money for textbooks <laughs> <laughs> when I was in college. Um, so I mean that that I guess that's where it started, but um, it has uh, continued to expand as I've started teaching and as I've uh, continued working with faculty. Um, on OER work. Thanks, Tiffany. Uh, so we heard from Nancy, who's at Georgia Southern in the College of Ed, interested in writing OER to prepare pre-service teachers to meet state standards. That's really interesting. Uh, I know that state standards can be pretty detailed and can kind of change um, as the years go on. So that would be an interesting one uh, to see the plan for. Um, welcome to uh, Mohammed Ahad from Georgia Southern uh, from Electrical and Computer Engineering. Awesome. Uh, Roberta, uh, Roberta Salmi uh, from the Department of Anthropology at the University of Georgia. Welcome. Uh, Bridget Garner at UGA College of Veterinary Medicine, Department of Pathology. Oh, very cool. First time applicant. Uh, Bronson Long, Professor of History at Georgia Highlands College, uh, interested in ALG in order to create a series of short videos for a new online economic history course. That's awesome. I know uh, GHC has a 
long history of creating uh, video series for their courses. It's been it's been really cool to see. Uh, welcome and welcome to Nicole Faison from Georgia Southern University uh, from University Housing. Cool. First time we're here. Uh, Lisa Bro from Middle Georgia State University. Welcome, English faculty. Uh, first time here. Would like to put together an OER textbook. Wow. Uh, Chandra, hello from Georgia College, uh, returning and of course open resources make education more accessible. Thumbs up. Uh, welcome to uh, Jun Fang Ku, uh, professor in computer science at Clayton State University, and welcome Allison Nooks at Middle Georgia State University in Macon. She's the design champion, goal to write uh, OER publications. Uh, she's the online academic program coordinator uh, for media and communication faculty and the uh, School of Arts and Letters as well. And open resource materials provides greater access to students. That's why it matters to me. Uh, the cost of textbook is true to success for many students. So that is why it matters. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, continue to uh, type in your introductions if you haven't just yet. Uh, we're going to keep going, but uh, that doesn't uh, stop you from answering that cool question. So uh, you're here about affordable materials grants. We're going to talk a little bit about why we do them. Um, this is an opt in opportunity uh, for you and a team of faculty, a team of faculty and professional staff like uh, for example, librarians who can be faculty, instructional designers who also can be faculty, um, and instructors to transform your courses with commercial textbooks to courses that use uh, OER or no cost or low cost materials. Um, continuous improvement grants are the things that used to be called mini grants if you were around for a while. Um, these are opportunities to improve on previously created OER or to create new OER for courses who are already using no cost or low cost resources and want to improve that course that way. So first we're going to talk about the basics of transformation grants. Um, transformation projects, uh, they were also kind of the old default textbook transformation grants have specific funding guidelines. So per team member, there is a maximum of $5,000. This covers salary, course release, travel, et cetera. Um, please keep in mind that fringes that are attached to things like salary or course release have to be included in this, um, but it doesn't have to be directly in this budget. You can figure that out with your budget office after the fact, but it's good to keep that in mind uh, as you're considering this project. Um, you can put in additional project expenses into your budget as well, but those need to be uh, explains in detail in the proposal budget. Like if you have, uh, for example, two iPads that you're purchasing, uh, what are the purchase? Uh, what are the purpose of those within the project? It has to be very sound because there's not just us reading these, but there are peer reviewers reading these, and we all need to know what the purpose of these additional project expenses are. Um, then there's the maximum total award per grant. So you can't go over 30,000. That means that if you have a team of six that are getting the maximum award of 5,000 each, then there isn't really a lot of room for other additional project expenses. Um, if you are, if you have a smaller team and you can, uh, it, then you can work within that maximum for sure. Uh, it used to be that we had small scale and large scale and small scale were 10,000 max uh, plus 800 for travel and then the large scale were 30,000. Now you can just scale it up based on the size of your team, uh, which makes things a little bit more flexible than it used to be. So if you have other project costs, uh, just be sure to be very clear why those are within the plan. I already kind of elaborated on that, so I've covered an entire slide already. Now, continuous improvement grants, these are the ones that used to be called mini grants. They are more about the revision and creation of OER, uh, especially in courses where there has already been some sort of no cost or low cost resource. Um, this is 2000 maximum per team member, this same thing for salary, for course release, for travel. Every institution works differently on this stuff. So um, it'll be dependent on what your institution can do and what they suggest. 
Um, and uh, just like with the other grants, the additional project expenses are allowed, but they need to be justified in the budget. And there is a 10,000 maximum total award per grant. So again, if you have the max team of five, or well, no, there, that's not a max team number, but let's say you had five team members getting the maximum of $2,000 each, then you would be at that 10,000 limit. If you have a smaller team, if you are taking less per team member, then you can add project expenses um, into that up to $10,000. And this is all about revision and creation. And the big thing that we want to note here is that uh, this kind of revision isn't just um, some sort of like, well, we took one chapter and we added a few new things to it and now we're all set. Um, this is a substantial improvement to a resource. So let's say that you have a sociology text and uh, sociology sure has changed in the past four or five years. You may need to make a substantial update to that and that's why you're going for this particular continuous improvement grant. Here's how it's going to work. Here's the plan. That's great. If it's more like uh, we just need to update this for spring 2021 from fall 2020, we have to change a couple dates on it. That's not what uh, a continuous improvement grant would really be uh, serving. And you can scale this all the way up to creating your own open textbook. That is a sometimes an ambitious en endeavor, but if you've got the right team, it's really cool. And plus, you may already have uh, your own created uh, modules in D2L that have functioned as a textbook for a long time. Maybe you want to make those open, uh, license them the right way and share them with the public. We can help you out on that. And of course, ancillary materials are any materials that support the instruction of a course uh, using some existing resources. So that would be things like lecture slides, a set of videos, um, stuff like that that had already been mentioned in here. And the same thing applies there. You just need to make sure that you're explaining any other expenses. Now, there are also, along with these two categories of grants, there are categories for priority. Um, these priorities give a couple of extra points uh, within the evaluation because they meet a strategic priority of ALG. But they are not the same thing as requirements. Uh, if you don't meet the four priority categories uh, that we have, that's totally OK. If you have a really good plan, that's what's important. Um, if you're going to make a huge impact on students, if you're going to create an amazing open textbook or video series or something like that, um, then don't worry too much about the priority categories if you've got an amazing plan uh, that you've that you've made in detail that reviewers really like. That's that's the real stuff, but you can help yourself out a little bit if you do meet these priorities. So for example, um, there is collaborative projects with professional support. This is to encourage folks to look beyond just their department and um, use the, uh, I want to say use the resources available, but really these are people. Uh, connect with the people that can help you out here too. Uh, so for example, if you have an instructional designer or librarian, um, publishers like the University of North Georgia Press, instructional technologists, a web designer if you're making a web-based tool, uh, programmers if you're making a simulation or you're doing something for IT uh, or uh, computer science, and graphic designers. Oh, uh, I have a question. Yes, okay, so Tiffany already answered in a why. Uh, do librarians at your own institution qualify as outside the team of instructors? Yes, yes, that is totally uh, correct. So this kind of collaboration can be institutional or it can be multi-institutional. It doesn't matter either way. I see someone else is typing a question. I'll keep going, but as soon as I see it. Oh, yep. Yeah. OK, will you please share the PowerPoint to the group? Yes, we are going to be sharing this on uh, both of the RFP sites along with the slide. Uh, so. For example, uh, the RFP page for round 20. We're going to be sharing the slides there. Um, same thing for uh, round 21 if you are applying for round 21. 
And Tiffany says most of the time these collaborators are at your institution, but you can go outside the institution depending on policies. Uh, Nancy says, do LibGuys qualify as an OER publisher? Well, if you had somebody from the LibGuides company on your team, that could work, but I don't really see that happening. I don't I don't think SpringShare would be uh, on the team as a collaborator most of the time, unless it was some really extenuating circumstance. Uh, but you can publish OER on a LibGuide for sure. If you're creating stuff on LibGuides, it is viewable to the public. If you put a Creative Commons license on that content, it is an open educational resource. Uh, some examples of OER publishers. So there aren't that many out there. Um, you could be working with OpenStax to create a new OpenStax text. I mean, that is a gigantic project, but it could be possible. Um, if you're working with university presses, absolutely. Uh, the I know that the UNG press does collaborate on the creation of new open textbooks. That's the most common on our projects. Um, but there are other university presses out there. There's ones that are just getting started. Um, for example, UGA Press has been around for a long time. They've been making a lot of scholarly monographs, but recently they are starting to get into open resources, so they may uh, be able to collaborate. So this isn't limited to just the UNG Press when we say this, but they're the most common one because they have worked with OER and worked with us um, on OER production for a long time. Yeah, thank you, Tiffany, um, for doing that. Uh, Shujubai says, can the supporters be on the budget if they are from the same institution? Yes, uh, that's that's totally fine. Um, librarians, instructional designers, they can be uh, within your institution for sure. We just want to make sure um, that as many teams as possible try to collaborate across the institution with people who have specialties in places that can help with finding OER, providing reading lists, uh, designing the course in a new way to leverage the power of open like instructional designers and technologists. Um, and then the, the people who are involved in production if you need help there like web designers and graphic designers. OK, the second one is student participation in materials creation, adaptation and evaluation. So in uh, in the open education realm, there's been a lot of discussions about how participation in the creation and the editing of open resources can help with the learning process. Uh, you're you're at kind of the higher levels of blooms if you're creating instructional resources as a student, especially if you're collaborating to do so. So this is a way to leverage a, a lot of what we call open pedagogy. Um, that means they could help with content creation, content remixing, editing, evaluating an open textbook. Um, this would not just be we are going to put uh, we are going to take students uh, regular survey of instruction responses into account. This would be a more deeper role where students are going to help out with this. Um, so this includes students as active participants in the grant. Now they can be on the team if uh, you want them to be compensated and if your institution allows for it. Uh, there are uh, assistantship programs that do allow for this. Um, but again, that's going to depend on your institution. It could just be as easy as your students are participating by being in the class with you, and here's the pedagogy that's going to help, and then you describe what that is. Uh, Tiffany is adding to this as well. Yeah, some teams will hire students as part of their grants, but it can also be a pedagogical move. Yep. Departmental scaling projects, uh, these are about uh, bringing your implementation to a department wide all section scale. Uh, this, ne this means that there needs to be a commitment from the department to at least pilot the project in all of their sections. If there's just the potential for it, like 
we've made this, we're going to put it into two of our sections, and it's possible that all 40 of them like it enough that they would be in all of the sections after that. That's not a departmental scaling project. That Your department needs to be committed to this project. They need to implement OER um, on that last semester of the project, just like you would be. Um, so it's not just potential, it is buy-in. And then upper level campus collaborations. Uh, so this is for upper level courses, uh, upper level undergrad and graduate courses, uh, including doctoral, um, that with courses that have smaller enrollment numbers, but are really important for uh, different degree programs. Uh, grants in this category involve collaborations between institutions for upper level courses. So this is a way to increase the impact of smaller enrollment courses. So this does have to be different institutions working together as opposed to the first priority, which is not. This is upper level campus collaborations. This one includes different institutions working together. OK, we'll talk a little bit about funding. I want to make sure that I give Tiffany ample time to uh, demonstrate how to apply. Uh, funding goes to the institution in the form of an agreement between the University System of Georgia's central office and the institution, which is part of the system. So it's not the same as an external grant. Um, this covers your, the direct stuff, the time, project expenses, um, any departmental needs, travel expenses, uh, and this funding happens 50% at the beginning, 50% at the end. So once the service level agreement is signed by all parties, that means execution, um, that's when the first invoice can be sent to us from your institution, and then we can pay that invoice through accounts payable. Um, then the final report is at the end, and once the final report is submitted, your institution can send us the second invoice. Uh, there are some institutions that will send it along with the final report. They'll send it early. That's awesome. It's not required, though. Oh, uh, Tiffany has an example of a successful cross-institutional project. Uh, so that is in the chat uh, in a link right there. Introduction to GIS. Yeah, with Uli and Grimm, and uh, they worked with UNG folks. Uh, so the additional guidelines here. Um, institutions are responsible for fund disbursement. Uh, budgets are supported by state funds, so they do need to follow the usual uh, state board of regents and institutional policies. Uh, a lot of the questions about what you can and can't do with funding uh, are usually answerable by that depends on your institution. Your grants office and your research office should know about all of this, uh, but if they have any questions, send them right over. Now, this usually does not include the federal and external grant guidelines that the USG lists on their site. If they do follow those guidelines, then you do have to follow those guidelines. It really depends. Uh, some institutions say we treat it like an external grant uh, just to be safe. And in that case, you may have some more restrictions. Uh, be sure to get in contact with your business or grants office about that. Um, direct funding is the only funding that we do. And when we say that, we mean that we fund direct project expenses. That means um, that means salary. That also means uh, salary for uh, course releases. That also means things like overage pay. But it depends on the institution how they do that. Fringes can be included on that. Uh, your, your salary is connected to things like healthcare expenses and taxes. That stuff can get figured into it. Your grants office or your research office should be able to tell you more about how it works for you specifically. Um, project supplies and software are also covered. Now, indirect expenses are not covered. These are things that you'll see only on federal and external grants. Uh, those are ones where the organization is not the University System of Georgia, your institution is not part of that organization, so that organization has to fund a little bit of the upkeep uh, for the facilities in order to keep all of this going. So you'll often see F and A, that means facilities and administration, that is an indirect expense. That stuff is not covered in these grants. Um, 
your grants offices should know about this, but just in case, if you get uh, any budget stuff back and you look at it and uh, someone has written in facilities and administration or F and A, be sure to uh, get rid of that before it gets submitted. So here's the timeline for round 20. Um, it's in a little bit less than a month. Monday, November 1st is the application deadline. Uh, the November 2nd through the 16th is when peer reviews happen. November 17th through the 19th um, is when administrative reviews happen. Notifications are on the 22nd and the online kickoff is Friday, December 10th. Uh, round 21, February uh, 14th is the deadline. And we say midnight, that doesn't mean, you know, 12 a.m. at the beginning of Monday. This means at the end of Monday. Um, Tuesday, February 15th uh, through March 1st is peer reviews. Our reviews happen after that, the 2nd through the 4th. Notifications happen on Monday, March 7th. Online kickoff on March 25th. So at least one team member of each transformation grants project needs to attend the kickoff meeting. It is a required part of it, the online synchronous portion. All members have to participate in the asynchronous training, and that stuff will be sent out to you if you are awarded. Uh, you'll have the links right there. Um, continuous improvement grants. You can participate in the synchronous online kickoff meeting. It's optional, but it is recommended. Uh, it is required, though, to fill out the uh, asynchronous training stuff. Um, Tiffany is uh, adding a little bit here, too. So we are about to run through how to apply for a grant. I'm going to turn this over to Tiffany at that point. But before that happens, do you have any questions about what we just went through? Oh, and Tiffany says these are requirements for after you've been selected for the grant. Yeah, you do not have to fill out any training stuff yet. That only happens once um, once the award notification is sent out. We send out things like links to the asynchronous training and uh, links to the synchronous training for uh, what's going to be run in Teams. OK, I think I'm going to uh, transfer this over to Tiffany, uh, so please take it away. OK, and perfect timing because I randomly started hearing background noise right at the end of that, <laughs> <laughs> like right as you were passing it to me. <clears throat> um, OK, so I'm going to take control. Um, so we're going to talk about how to apply um, and uh, we'll we'll start with um, bookmarking the main grants page. So um, Jeff, if you want to drop the link in the chat, um, you guys may be able to click the one on the screen as well. I'm not sure. Um, but you want to bookmark the pages for whichever round you're hoping to apply for, or you could just book the main grants page or uh, bookmark the ma main grants page. That's fine too. Um, but the important thing is that you have easy access to them and uh, so that you can read through it um, all the way, make sure that you fully understand everything. Um, then on those pages, um, there are offline Word document proposals that you're going to complete. So you're going to need to do the full Word document, fill everything in on there. Um, and I'm going to show you that the Word document in a minute. Um, and then you want to save that because you're going to then fill out a form that will also require you to submit that Word document that you completed. <clears throat> and that form, we, uh, we've, we've jumped around a little bit on the systems that we use for that form, but uh, this for these two rounds, we are using Alchemer, which is uh, what we've been moving towards. And it's much easier for us and also for you guys. So, Let's look at the Word documents. Let me get my screen changed here. OK, do you see this? Yep. All right. Um, OK, so uh, this is our main ALG page. Um, so if you are um, not familiar with this page or haven't um, you know, haven't spent a lot of time looking at it. This is a good place to start the affordable learning Georgia.org website. Um, we have a nice big button to get to our grants page on there. 
You can also find it from the about menu if you uh, if you need to. I tend to just click the big giant button, but it's also here under about and affordable materials grants. Um, from there, you'll see all of our rounds. So, uh, but you'll find the request for proposals for both round 20 and round 21 here. Um, so you'll go to the one that you want to look out, look at, and I'm going to stick to round 20 for now, but they look pretty much identical except for dates right now. You're going to want to read through this page entirely. Um, so you'll, you know, read through the description, read through these example projects, maybe even click some of these links to look at uh, some of the examples that we provide. Um, there's also a ton of other examples. These are not the only ones that you can look at. So if you're looking for something specific, um, just let us know and we can probably direct you uh, in the right, send you in the right direction. <clears throat> We've got a description of the transformation grants and the continuous improvement grants. Um, and then you have the application process. So your, uh, so we've got a thorough request for proposals document, um, which you may or may not have seen, but this is a Word document that's going to uh, give you all of the information that's on this page, as well as uh, some additional information. Um, and then you've got your rubrics for the two different types of grants. You should definitely review those, and I'll also talk about those at the end of the presentation. And then, uh, and then you have your Word versions for the application form. So these are the Word documents that I was talking about on the last slide, um, where you want to choose the type of grant that you're applying for, so transformation or continuous improvement, um, and you're going to download it and I'm going to have to change my screen again because I think I set it to only share the web page. So let me do that. Sorry about that, guys. Let me just change this to screen. OK, so we have. Oh, yep, you can see it. All right, cool. <clears throat> So we have our, <clears throat> sorry, I'm having some throat problems right now. Um, so we have our Word document. This is for the transformation grants. So uh, we've got some notes for you to keep in mind. These are uh, mostly like uh, technical stuff about this form to keep in mind. Um, and then we'll, we've got an explanation about the kickoff meeting as well. But then you're going to give us your applicant and team information. So um, your institution, uh, the applicant name is the uh, the person from the team that is applying for this grant. So it, it's probably your team lead. Um, then you might also have a submitter. So it depends on how your institution works. Your submitter may be the same person as the applicant. And if they are, then you can leave the submitter blank. Um, but some institutions have it set up so that may, they have the grant, someone from the grants office submit for them. And in that case, you would put the person that's submitting the actual, submitting the application to us in that, uh, in these three spots here, submitter name, email, and position title. <clears throat> but, uh, it really just depends on what your, how your institution works. Then you're going to include your team members. So you have uh, you're going to give us their names and their email addresses. And we have six here because that is uh, the assumed maximum. If you're taking the maximum amount uh, per person, that doesn't mean that you can't have more team members, though. If you're taking uh, a smaller amount or setting your budget up to do a smaller amount so that you can have more team members, that's fine. Just add them in here. Just add more lines to this uh, table or uh, put them in the text box here. Either way is fine. Project information. So um, then we're going to you're you're going to start filling in uh, some sort of technical information about your project. So uh, your priority categories, if you have one, you're going to you know, or if you have more than one, you're going to put them into this box here, which we have a little bit of an explanation here. You can, um, you, you, you'll put in the priority category or categories that you, uh, that match your project. 
You're also going to put your requested total amount of funding, keeping in mind that that 30,000 is a maximum on transformation grants. You're going to put your final semester of the project. So uh, for round 20, that's going to be fall 2022 <clears throat> for transformation projects. Continuous improvement projects, I believe, have an option between two semesters, uh, but your transformation projects are going to end in fall 2022. And then uh, if you're using, if you're planning to use an OpenStax textbook or you know you're going to use an OpenStax textbook, let us know because uh, we may be able to direct you to some additional uh, support and resources before you actually get started. Um, if you don't know the answer to this yet, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Just say no. You can always contact us later on to ask for those extra resources if you want them. For the impact data, this is really important here. Um, so we want to we want you to put a single averaged or totaled number in each box as appropriate. So as what makes sense for your project. Um, we don't want ranges. Um, we don't want math equations. Um, we don't want to have like multiple lines with different numbers for each course. Each so each box in these tables should be one single number. Um, we have this document set up so that you have a separate table per course. So we list the table for course one. Um, we also get, so I think we give you up to like course four, which you don't have to keep all of them. Um, but if you have more than four courses, you would just copy and paste the table and add that, you know, add a new table for that course. Um, we just don't want you to combine things into one if it doesn't make sense to do that. Now, if you're all, if everyone on your team is teaching the same course and currently uses all the same materials and are planning on using all the same materials or are planning on having the same impact numbers, so if you're all planning on removing, uh, you know, all, removing all textbook costs. <clears throat> then you don't have to list each person's courses individually. You can put those all together. That's OK. Um, it's this is more for if you are having uh, like, let's say you you have maybe four different courses in a program all working together on one grant, which is pretty common. We get a lot of projects like that. Um, and those courses, because they're totally different courses, they also use totally different textbooks right now with totally different textbook costs. That's when we would want you to include each course in its own table. So for each course, you're going to give us the title and number and the instructor or instructors for that course. <clears throat> and then you're going to give us the Average number of students enrolled per section. So that's um, e for each section that is taught in this course. What's the average number of students? You'll give us the average number of affected course sections scheduled in a summer semester, a fall semester, and a spring semester. So uh, because sometimes this will vary. Um, and this is uh, this is your number of course sections, not your number of students in course sections. So just make sure that you're uh, fully reading these questions because sometimes uh, we get mixed up numbers. Um, just because of because they're all asking for different things. So your number of course sections scheduled. And if this is a course that is only being taught by that, you know, by one person on your team, then you would only list the course sections taught by that team member, especially if you're, especially because you're going to then list the other courses for the other team members in a separate table. We don't want to have too much duplication. We'd like to avoid any duplication. The total number of course sections scheduled. So, and we give you a little hint here. Um, some of these are going to be math problems that you have to do. So, we, we're going to have you add up rows two through four. We're going to add up these three rows here, and that's going to be your answer. Um, your total number of student section enrollments for, per academic year, that's going to be your answer here, multiplied by the number of students enrolled per section, which you gave in row one. 
you're going to give us the original required course materials. So for this, we want the title, the author, and the price for a new copy purchased from either your campus bookstore, directly from the publisher, or Amazon, and a URL lead, like showing us where that price is. Sometimes your bookstore doesn't let you have like a direct link to the textbook. <coughs> Um, if that's the case, um, that's okay. We sh we should be able to find it. Like if you direct us to the right place to look in at, on, on the bookstore website. Um, but if not, then then we can uh, we'll be able to reference the publisher or the Amazon. Um, we choose we say these three primarily because those are where students are primarily purchasing your textbooks from. Um, there are lots of other websites they might be buying from, um, and that's okay. Uh, we're looking for the average price that students are spending um, on your textbook. Then you're going to give us the original cost. So um, you've given us the information about the textbook. Now we want the original cost of all of the materials. Uh, so in in row seven, you might have multiple items here. Um, you might have, you know, three or four textbooks, depending on what your course is and what kinds of things you have required. Um, then in row eight, you're going to take all take the cost of all of those and add them up into one. So this is the cost that one student pays for all of your course materials in that course. Then you'll give us the average post project cost per student. So if you're planning on not having students purchase anything, then your answer here is zero. Um, but some some teams will do uh, low cost, so they'll look for like homework platforms that cost thirty dollars or less, um, and and that's fine. But we want to know that what that average post project cost is going to be. <clears throat> um, your average post project savings. That's going to be the post project cost. Um, uh, it's going that's going to be the cost that they were that they would have originally paid subtracted with the post prod ooh i'm getting my words mixed up subtract row 8 row 9 from row 8 <laughs> um and that'll give you the savings uh so most of the if you if you're doing a zero cost then you can probably just pull row 8 over here um but if you do have a cost after the project then you're going to need to um you're going to need to include the um, you're going to need to include that as uh, sort of showing what, what your total savings are going to be. And then your projected total annual student savings per academic year. So um, you're going to take the per student savings and multiply it by how many students you have you typically have in an academic year. And you're going to do that for each course. So I'm going to scroll through here. <clears throat> and again, if you have more courses to add, you can copy the table as many times as you need to. Um, you can also remove the tables if there's not, you know, if there if you only have one course or only have two, you can always remove the extra tables just to clean up the document a little bit if you want. Um, you're going to give us your project goals. So goals for transformation grants uh, go beyond just cost savings. So we want to know what your goals are for, for those savings, but also for student success, materials creation, and pedagogical transformation. You're also going to give us a statement of transformation. So um, we're looking for a description of the current state of the course, the department, or the institution, if that's relevant to the project. Um, but at least we should be we would like to know about the current state of the course at the very at a very minimum. And then you're going to talk about the project itself. What are you actually proposing to do for this project and how is it going to impact the course department and institution uh, as uh, as appropriate? <clears throat> Um, this is a good place to include any research that you've done on OER or on reducing the cost of textbooks or on anything that relates to your project and what you're trying to do here. This is a good place to include that. And that is also going to look better to your reviewers too. So uh, think about doing some research 
include some references um, to sort of show us that you you have done the research to show that this project is going to make a difference or that you hope this project will make a difference based on that research. You're going to give us your action plan. Um, so this is where you're going to tell us uh, what the roles of each team member are go is going to be. What will each person be doing on the project? Um, you'll give us a brief review of any existing resources that you've looked at. So possible things that you might adopt, even if you don't know exactly what you're going to adopt yet or, um, you know, what you're going to create. You should be looking at what's available and uh, considering, you know, if, if any of those are possibilities. Um, we're also looking for a plan for your selection, adoption, adaptation, or creation of any new stuff. So um, give us a plan and also include in that plan what you plan to do as far as open licensing and accessibility, um, because those are requirements on the grant. Your, uh, anything new that you create needs to be openly licensed with a CC BY license and needs to be made accessible. And we do provide you the resources to make that happen. Um, then you're going to tell us the plan for re redesigning your course, because when you, anytime you change the course resources, your textbook or your materials, it does typically require you to change some things in your course as well. So any additional uh, course or curriculum changes, um, You'll tell us about that here as well. And then uh, your plan for sharing your resources openly. Um, so a lot, a lot of teams will host their new re their resources uh, using the, re the, thing, the tools that are available to them at their institution. Um, and, and then, but then there are also a lot of teams that will just create their resources in Word and send that to us. That's fine. Just tell us what your plan is, because uh, whichever way you go, ALG is going to host your materials in our own repository as well. And so um, if you plan to host elsewhere and then have us uh, access them there, that's fine. Just tell us that. If you plan on just having us go ahead and host only on our thing, that's fine too. The important thing here is to remember that D2L isn't going to work. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't put your stuff in D2L, um, but it also needs to be hosted elsewhere <clears throat> because we can't access your stuff inside D2L, which means no one else can either, except your students. Um, quantitative and qualitative measures. Um, we would like to see uh, measurements of student satisfaction, performance, and course retention, so DFW rates. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to do this. Um, so think about what's going to work for your project and tell us how you plan to measure those things. So um, your quantitative or qualitative measure to be used with a description of the methods and tools that you plan on using. And then also let us know uh, if you plan to work with IRB or if you're going to need to work with IRB to make this research happen. Um, because your final report where you're going to report this stuff is going to be hosted openly. So um, you'll want to think through that as well with your IRB team. Then your timeline. Um, so. Oh, this is old, actually. Uh, this Google form thing. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> this you can ignore this point here. Yeah, I got to fix that. Yeah, you actually can if you want uh, use a table here um, because you're not going to transfer into Google Forms. Um, but it, most of the time, just a bulleted list is, is going to work just fine. We just want to know uh, a list of your major milestones, events, and deadlines uh, that go with your action plan in the final semester of your project. So you should be keeping, uh, also keeping in mind report deadlines, so, uh, especially the final report. Um, but you might think about also including uh, semester reports as well, because uh, that will help you stay on track and make sure that you're not missing report deadlines as well. Um, your budget information, you're going to give us some information about your budget, uh, including those uh, additional justifications for any added project expenses that Jeff was talking about. 
make sure that you include all of that here. Um, and same thing here. Most of the time people just do a bolded list. Um, that's perfectly fine. Sustainability plan. Uh, so this is where you're going to be thinking beyond the project. So how does how do you and your team plan on maintaining these resources in the future? Um, you know, how are you how are you going to maintain and update them as needed? Um, what kind of commitment do you have from the department or institution to continue using affordable materials, whether it's the exact ones you create or updated versions? Um, and then uh, any possible expansion of the project to more course sections. So maybe your department is using this project as like a pilot for the future. Let us know that. Let us know if your department is considering expanding on to other courses. Um, and then also your future plans for sharing this work with others. So uh, at conferences maybe or publishing in a journal. Uh, if you do research on it, uh, let us know if you have any plans to do stuff like that. And it, if you do do stuff like that, send it send it to us so that we can uh, share it. We we like to keep track of the research done from our projects. Here, uh, so we have these listed out here: the Creative Commons terms and your accessibility terms. These are going to be check boxes that you also have to check and agree to in the form when you submit it. Um, but these are your rules. Or, or I guess your requirements as far as uh, Creative Commons and accessibility go. Um, by default, ALG, the, the, any new stuff that's created um, needs to be done under a CC by license unless there is a reason, some other reason for a more restrictive license, like if you're using re resources that are share alike or um, have uh, some other restriction on them. Uh, and in those cases, you would tell us that. Then your accessibility terms, which will also give you some additional information about those Creative Commons uh, licenses so that you fully understand what uh, what that means when you go through the training. Accessibility requirements, um, we're going to give you some instructions and some resources on how to make things accessible. Um, and so then you're, requ you're also required to make any new materials accessible, uh, you, at least to the standards that uh, we provide. We're also going to have you give us a letter of support from ideally the department chair from, the, from your corresponding project. Um, but if your department chair is on the uh, on the project, then you may need to go a step ahead of that. Um, <clears throat> but we're looking for a letter of support acknowledging that they will provide support for fund disbursement. This may not be something that is uh, that falls into their uh, in, into the department's lap. It depends on what your institution does. Um, but we want to see that support. We want to see that they are OK with you, you know, and approve of you doing this project. Um, and we also want, would like to see an acknowledgement of the sustainability. So, um, you know, are they going to encourage or allow you to continue using affordable resources after the grant is complete um, and and any additional sustainability uh, plans for them that for the department uh, from the department chair as well? Oh, I'm taking way too long on this. Sorry, guys. There's so much to cover. Um, if you have multiple institutions, you need one from each 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 institution, and then you also need to meet with your grants office, um, and they should be providing just a letter that says yes, we met, and yes, we covered everything that we need. Um, and this is a form now, so it's not even uh, a letter anymore. It's going to be oh. pretty easy. There you go. Yeah, sorry. I said letter. It's actually just a form that your grants office has to fill out acknowledging that they have uh, they have seen your project before you submitted it. Um, so let me switch here. Oh, where am I? Luckily, the rest of this has a lot of duplication uh, that goes into the transformation grant uh, one. The continuous improvement word application form has stuff from the transformation grant one with just a, a couple of differences, right? Yeah, there's I, 
I, I think it's more just uh, a few things that are removed from it rather yes. than added. So there's, it's going to be a lot of that transformation stuff with a few things that you don't have to do for continuous improvement grants. Uh, so I, I'll I'll skip that since we do since we are running low on time. Yeah, basically with transformation grants, you have to talk about how many students you're affecting. With continuous improvement grants, it assumes that this stuff is already low cost or no cost, so you don't have to put all that data in. And there's not a big research project on DFW rates because of that too. Yeah. Um, and then we have uh, we have a link to that grants office form that you need to get signed. Um, and then we have the link to the online application, uh, which will take you to let me do that in a separate tab, which will take you to the Alchemer form. Um, and this form, this is going to ask you to repeat some of the things that you did in the Word document. Um, like a lot of the numbers and stuff we're going to have you put in here because that helps us uh, do our own calculations and spreadsheet stuff afterwards. Um, so we're going to have you fill a lot of that stuff in um, and uh, and I'll just like quick quickly click through this as fast as I possibly can uh, to show you and <laughs> make sure I don't miss anything. <laughs> So you'll fill in some, uh, again, some duplicated information. Now there's some here. required stuff here, so you probably just want to do like testing and then just copy and paste. Or you can put A, that works. That works, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, you'll fill in your team members. All of this is duplicated stuff from your Word form. And while it's duplicated, it's important to us because it's all in one Excel file at this point, which will help us put all of our data together. Yeah. Your uh, course number, so the, the courses that you gave us all those tables on. Um, I'm sorry if you can, sorry if you can hear that in the background. A big truck just drove by and I have my window open. Um, the, uh, the course tables, we actually don't ask you for all of the numbers that we asked for in that table. So make sure that you do read these carefully and are including the right, uh, the right numbers that we're asking for here. course titles and numbers, uh, none of this is required. Um, your uh, priorities, requested amount, $1, and <laughs> um, you're going to give us the information from about the person that gave you the letter of support. And then you're going to upload that Word application as well as your letter of support and your grants business office acknowledgement form. Uh, we're also going to, for one, ask you if you plan on creating new stuff. And then if you are, we're going to ask you to explain how you plan to host and license those materials. Uh, so where do you plan on putting them so that people outside of your class can access them? And what kind of license do you plan on putting on it? And I didn't put an A in there. And then it's going to give you a brief uh, overview of what you submitted. Uh, as you can see, we've got a lot of A answers here. And then submit uh, when you're finished. So that's the online form. Sorry, I had to jump through no that problem. super quick. And there's quick. a download PDF version right on that link, so you can just click it right then and uh, save the whole thing. Oh, on the previous page? Yep. Oh, sorry, I missed that, guys. No, but that's OK. Yeah, it's there. Um, OK, let me go. let me come back here. We didn't talk about the rubrics, um, and you have the PowerPoint. Sorry. Uh huh. Jeff. Okay. So the rubrics are on the RFP page with everything else. Uh, they are really small on the PowerPoint, so I'm not even going to bring the PowerPoint back up. Um, check them out on the RFP pages. This is exactly what the peer reviewers are going to be looking for, so it'll help you out so much if you check on that. Um, so yeah. Um, that is going to be it from us today. Uh, I'm going to open this up for questions and I am going to enable microphone for attendees just in case you want to ask over mic. Um, so, and again, uh, sorry everyone for uh, going so long on that one uh, you know, on our Word document. There's just quite a lot to cover there. So. Oh yeah, and if you get through one of those applications, you've got you've kind of got through most of the material. Um, so yeah, uh, 
If you want to type a question into chat, you can, or you can do it over the mic. I'm going to mute myself so that you can, uh, you're, you're able to speak up. Uh, Dr. Long says, is there anything we need to consider in creating materials for a completely new course? Now, that's a tough one. Um, if you are going to do a transformation grant project, it's tough to talk about creating materials for an entirely new course because you had not been previously using any materials in the course. However, if you do not have the extra time that it takes to do all of this OER work, especially uh, creating things, revising stuff, um, there may be a text that you by default would have gone to. That's the one that you'll list and you'll just have to put it into the descriptions, uh, into the narrative to make sure that peer reviewers know this is a new course. This is what we would have used if we didn't have the extra time. Here's why this work takes extra time. Um, that way, the reviewers know where the money is going and why it's important. And they know uh, that this is still going to be student savings, even though you have a new course. That if you want to avoid that altogether, you can do a continuous improvement uh, grant projects where uh, you're not looking at the student impact and student savings stuff. If it's assumed that, yeah, we're going to use no cost materials no matter what, that might be um, your option. Thank you. Oh, and thank you, Dr. Remler. Any other questions before we head out? Oh, I see Allison's typing. Oh, thank you very much. And and yes, you too. Stay safe. Um, yeah, uh, I guess we'll end that here. Uh, thank you all for attending. As soon as we are able to get the recording up on the websites, we're going to be sending that out uh, to everybody who registered. And it'll be on the RFP pages ready to go. So thank you so much. Contact us at uh, Tiff uh, Tiffany Tiharina at usg.edu and Jeff Dalant at usg.edu. Uh, there's a dot in between both of our names there. And yeah, thank you so much. Have a great uh, day, and I can't wait to see these proposals. It, it seems like everybody's got some really cool things that they've got planned. Thank you, Tiffany, too. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.